Hello, B here. Welcome back to biology and to our first lesson on cells. We've mentioned cells a few times in this course and hopefully what you know so far is that they are the basic units of life. Today, I have a mystery picture for you. What are we looking at here? Any ideas? I'll give you a hint. This was drawn from something seen under a microscope all the way back in the year 1665. I'll let you think about it for a few minutes. Meanwhile, did you know that the first microscopes date back to the 1590s? A Dutch lens maker named Zacharias Janssen made a compound microscope like this one that could magnify an object at least 20 times its original size. That sounds super exciting until we remember that modern microscopes can magnify objects by 100 times or even a thousand times, but 20 was still pretty impressive in the 1500s. You can find out more about modern microscopes in the PDF for this lesson, but for now, just know that a microscope is a device that uses lenses to bend light and magnify objects. Before we get back to our mystery microscope picture, let's go over our goals for today. We will summarize historical contributions to cell theory and define the three main points of cell theory. In 1665, an English scientist, Robert Hooke, thought the Janssen microscope could use a little work, so he came up with this contraption. Notice that it required an oil lamp. No electric lights in the 1600s. In this picture, the microscope is looking at a small green leaf. Hooke observed all sorts of things under his new microscope and made detailed drawings which he published in a book, Micrographia. His drawings of mice, fleas, ants, and other things were both mesmerizing and a little disturbing to some readers, who often didn't even believe that what they were seeing was real. Since cameras hadn't been invented yet, we are fortunate that Hook was multi-talented enough to not only be a clever scientist, but also an accomplished artist. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to appreciate the sense of wonder that his findings inspired. And you can still buy his book today. Of course, he also saw these little guys, our mystery photo from earlier. This is what he saw when he put a slice of cork under the microscope. He was actually seeing dead plant cells, though he didn't realize it at the time, because the concept of cells hadn't arisen yet. He thought they looked like the tiny rooms that monks live in at a monastery, which are called cells and the name stuck. Here is a floor plan of a monastery. I can see the resemblance. Until the invention of the microscope, we didn't have the ability to see something so small. This technology and findings from scientists like Hook eventually lead to the formation of what is now known as the cell theory. In 1674, only a few years after Hooke saw his cork cells and published Micrographia, another lens maker, Antony von Leeuwenhoek, continued to make improvements in the design of the microscope. Instead of looking at dead bugs under his microscope, like Robert Hooke, he looked at drops of water and saw a whole world of living organisms there. He called them animalcules. We now know that they were microscopic creatures called protozoa, but this made him the first person to observe something still alive under the microscope. Later, he was even able to see bacteria. This is a replica of the microscope he built, and listen to how he described his observations. In all falling rain, carried from gutters into water butts, animalcules are to be found. And that in all kinds of water, standing in the open air, Animalcules can turn up, for these animalcules can be carried over by the wind, along with the bits of dust floating in the air. 
If you want to replicate Lou and Hook's experience, just gather up some pond water near where you live and look at it under a microscope. You'll almost certainly see some of his animalcules, and they are pretty cute. Over the next century, scientists continued to look at living things under the microscope, hoping to build on what had already been discovered. But the next big breakthrough didn't come until 1838. Two German scientists, Matthias Schleiden and Theodor Schwann, concluded together that all living things were made of cells. Schleiden was studying plants and Schwann was more interested in animals but they had both decided that their organisms of interest were cell-based. And of course, as far as they knew, that covered all life forms. We know now that they were leaving out a few, but we can forgive them. Their statement still holds true, even with the additional kingdoms of life we have discovered since then. This led to the establishment of the first two points in what is now known as classical cell theory. Number one, all living things are made of cells. And number two, cells are the basic units of life. But where do cells come from? Scientists once thought that life could arise through spontaneous generation, which is the idea that cells come from non-living things. But this idea was finally disproved by Louis Pasteur in 1858. You can read more about his swan-necked flask experiment which is considered to have settled the debate once and for all in the lesson PDF. If life must come from life and living things are made of cells, do all cells have to come from other cells? Around the same time that Pasteur was doing his famous experiment, a well-known and respected German doctor, Rudolf Virchow, was studying cells too. At the time, he was most known for his medical accomplishments. He was the first to recognize leukemia. He discovered the mechanism of pulmonary blood clots and was an outspoken advocate for public health. He gave a series of lectures describing his idea that omnis cellula as cellula, or all cells come from other cells. That was Latin, by the way. This was a conclusion which he came to after extensive studies of how wounds heal and the observation of cells dividing at the wound site. It became the third point of modern cell theory. However, about five years prior to Virchow's declaration, another doctor, Robert Remack, published the exact same idea. Remack didn't have the standing in the medical community that Virchow did, so no one paid him much mind, and Virchow was given credit. Did Virchow intentionally steal his idea, or were they both just really smart? I guess we'll never know. Obviously, lots of scientists contributed to what we now know about cells but you've seen just a few of the important contributions. These make up the classical cell theory, which includes three tenets or main ideas. One, all living organisms are composed of cells. Two, the cell is the basic unit of structure and function in organisms. And three, cells come from pre-existing cells. You may have heard the question, what came first, the chicken or the egg? We have the same conundrum here. If all cells come from other cells, where did the first cells come from? And a chicken egg is literally a cell, so it's almost the same question. It is likely that they came from protocells billions of years ago, which were self-replicating molecules of organic compounds. Scientists have been able to create models of these in the lab and demonstrate that they would have been capable of obtaining nutrients and growing. Over time, these may have evolved to become real cells. It's still an area of current research, so maybe you'll be the one to make the next big discovery here. The classical cell theory was established in the 1800s. I think it's safe to say we've learned a bit about cells since then. Do we need to add anything to it? It turns out, yes. We now have an additional set of tenets called the modern cell theory. 
They state that DNA can be transferred between cells, cells of similar species are largely the same, and that energy can flow between cells. We've said that living things are made of cells, but is a single cell alive? Yes, of course. A cell is the smallest particle that can be considered to be alive all on its own. In fact, many organisms are just that, one cell. They are called unicellular organisms and include bacteria, archaea, and many protists. The organisms you're more likely familiar with, animals, plants, fungi, yourself, are multicellular, meaning they are made of many cells. And in case you were wondering, many can be as few as a thousand, like in the case of the tiny nematode, or as many as 100 quadrillion in the case of the blue whale. Us humans are somewhere in the middle, containing trillions of cells. Now that I've left some big numbers rattling around in your head, let's wrap up what we've done today. Remember that cells are the basic unit of life, and every single living thing you see is made of them. In this lesson, we summarized some historical contributions to cell theory, and we defined the three main points of cell theory. You might have guessed from some of the pictures we've looked at so far that not all cells are the same. In the next few lessons, we'll look at some of the different types of cells that organisms can be made of. Until then, remember that biology isn't just science, it's the way of life. Hey, hey.